So we're now recording. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this um, open lecture series uh, with the project of EUNIWELL, which is the European University for Wellbeing. Uh, my name is Daniel Walker. I work at the University of Birmingham in the UK as a project officer. For the meeting today, you'll see that you have the hide the captions logo on the bottom. If you just click on it, you can see the captions and this um, this lecture will also be recorded. The lecture will be about 45 minutes, then you'll have about 10 to 15 minutes to answer any questions. If you do have any questions, you can put it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself um, at the end. I'm going to now pass it over to my colleague, Hannah. Hello, uh, thanks, Dan. My name is Hannah uh, Lowe, and I am the uh, project coordinator for UniWell uh, here at the University of Birmingham. Uh, we're really delighted to welcome Megan today, who will be giving her um, her open lecture. Uh, and without further ado, I'll, I'll pass on to her and um, in, wish everyone an enjoyable uh, 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to give the lecture this afternoon. My name is Megan Campbell. I am a reader in international human rights law at the University of Birmingham. And I'm going to be asking the question today about is equality law up to the challenge of the 21st century? So I will do that by sharing my PowerPoint slides and my ability to use technology. We can test that as well. So I am an equality law lawyer and my research focuses a lot on the intersection between women's equality and poverty. And we'll be asking today, is equality law up to the challenges we're seeing in the 21st century? So it'll be sort of two parts to the lecture. The first part will explore the doctrinal twists and turns of equality. When we talk about or think about equality, many people will have an intuitive sense about what, what that means. Um, but we'll go through the first bit to try to unpack competing meanings of what, it, what does it mean to be equal? and think about what might be the limitations of some of the more traditional definitions of equality and what, what we might be wanting to achieve with equality and think about more substantive or transformative models. And then in the second half, we'll look at what are the challenges that we're seeing in the 21st century. And I've identified three on this slide, economic inequality and the rise in economic inequality, which we can see uh, across the world right now in the cost of living crisis, COVID, which we've all experienced, and the climate crisis and think about whether our conceptions of equality and our, our right, legal right to equality are up to tackle these, these challenges and how these challenges might be viewed or conceptualized through the lens of a right to equality. So turning to the first, this definitional um, component of the lecture, which is a very weird like thing to be, be consumed about, which is what do words mean? You'll, in most jurisdictions around the world, there is a right to equality. That every person should be treated equally. And we use and think about equality in, in so much in our day-to-day our -day lives that we're not even aware of. Um, most children will be very experts in, in equality. They'll be very aware that their sibling may have gotten more or less dessert than they are having. Um, so they have a very intuitive sense about what does it mean to be treated equally. And the most, um, I guess, historically rooted or historically cons um, consistent understanding about what it means to be treated equally is the idea of what we now call formal equality. That like people should be treated alike and different people should be treated differently. And that what we're trying to achieve with our, our right to equality is that everybody should be treated in a consistent and non-arbitrary manner. That to, to lean on my sibling example, both siblings should have the exact same amount of cake to make sure that there's nothing inconsistent or arbitrary about how they're being treated. But we can see from this definition that there's, there's a, two components. One is that like people should be treated alike, but it also means that different people can be treated differently. So if you're different from the group, you are not entitled to similar treatment, but you are it's permitted to treat you differently. And this concept of formal equality has had, as I said, a deep um, hold on in history. And in legal and political thinking, but there are a lot of problems with it. And the picture I put on the slide is a picture of, of people um, on a boat seeking refuge. And the question would be, what are, are they like citizens or are refugees different than citizens? Do refugees have a claim to be treated like everybody else? Or are they different people who can be treated differently? And that leads us to start to think about, well, what are, what are the problems with 
this kind of idea of equality being about consistent or identical or similar treatment. Because it raises a question about who is alike and who is different. We can see throughout history that women, people of color, people who are differently abled, people of a different um, sexual orientation than heterosexuality, people who um, don't identify in a gender binary have been seen as different and it has been legally permissible to treat them differently. And inevitably that differential treatment that is legally permitted is lesser treatment. It, women, people of color, differently able people have been oppressed and marginalized and excluded and denied rights in their own body even because they've been seen as different. And then it, under formal equality approach, if you're different, it is permissible to treat you differently. And the phrase who is alike and who is different or the, or the maxim treating people alike and treating people differently doesn't tell us anything about, well, why are men and women the same when it comes to a right to voting? Why are men, women, non-gender binary identifying people the same when it comes to accessing marriage or accessing social benefits or accessing identity documents? There's nothing in our thinking about consistent treatment that helps us understand why are people similar and why are people different? Back to my refugee and citizen example would be, well, why are refugees and citizens treated differently? Why are these people two different groups of people seen as different? And is that correct? Are they different or, or actually are they the same? The other problem with formal equality or treating likes alike is this problem of consistency. Formal equality tries to make sure everybody's treated the same. And that can sometimes be really important. Um, we can think about equal pay. If women and men are performing the exact same job, we want them to be treated the exact same. But consistent treatment might not always be our goal. Treating someone who has uh, different, different uh, abilities, such as you know, they might need a wheelchair or they might need um, visual um, software to deal with any sort of visual impairments or software to deal with hearing impairments, treating them the same as people who have full capabilities of eyesight and hearing is not good. That doesn't help the person who has um, the different ability to access education. So treating everybody the same might not recognize that some people have different needs. Um, treating a pregnant woman the same as a man is not, um, not the goal because a pregnant woman has different needs during her pregnancy. So consistency might not recognize that some people are starting from a different, um, different point or that people have different needs and that treating them consistently might perpetuate disadvantage, might perpetuate exclusion, might perpetuate the things that we seemingly want our equality law to address. The other problem is um, of comparators. Equality law is seen as almost to be inherently comparative, but there can be some problems with only looking at equality law through a comparator. So only looking to see am I being treated the same as somebody else. If a, a woman is pregnant and she says, I've been treated differently at work, it's very hard to show who she's being treated differently then because she's in a different condition. It's then okay to treat her differently. And there's no comparator to show that she should be treated the same as because there is no pregnant man at work to say, I should be treated the same as a pregnant man. Obviously, my, my example here depends on the sort of more gender binary. Obviously, it's not just women who can become, who can become pregnant. The other problem with comparators comes out in the equal pay case law. So women and men tend to be clustered in different professions. Um, just to use a trite example, men cr cluster in construction work and women cluster in daycare. There's, if women are low paid in daycare because we as a society do not value care work, well, we, oh, we, we value construction work. If we compare everyone who works in the daycare, we don't see any unequal pay. So all the daycare workers are being tr treated the same. It's only when we start to look broader that we get to see that there's systemic issues about which professions we have valued monetarily and which professions we have not valued. And we see often the professions that are not valued have lots of systemic um, issues at stake around who's performing that work. The fourth problem about formal quality is it's leveling down. So formal quality only wants consistency. And if you have an, uh, an inconsistency, you can, you can solve it by taking away benefits from people. So there's two cases I put on the slide that are from the US Supreme Court. And the first one talks about uh, schools that were segregated in the Southern US between black people and white people. The court said you had to desegregate the pools because it was unfair to have the black people forced to go to a, a lesser pool. 
And so they forced integration. And in response, the um, city shut down both pools. So everybody was equal because everybody was treated the same and not having access to a swimming pool. Again, that's not truly the point of equality law to take away benefits from people. In Session Morales, a more recent case, you can see it in relation to um, citizenship. They've taken benefits away from women to make them equal with men. And the last problem with formal equality is this treatment of difference. So it says different people can be treated differently. And that might not be the point of equality law. We don't want everyone to be treated the same. We want to recognize and respect and valorize difference. Our differences among lines of gender, lines of sexual orientation, lines of ability, lines of language, are things that we want to celebrate, um, the diversity of the human experience. We don't want to stigmatize and make, make people pair, pardon me, bear a burden for being different, but we want to not only accommodate, but celebrate those differences. And treating everybody the same, having that be the end goal of equality is a very limited understanding of the human experience. So this failure of equality law, of formal equality, pardon me, to achieve some of the foundational things we think equality should be doing has led courts and theorists to develop other models of equality. Quality results, equality of opportunity, dignity, and a multidimensional concept of equality. And we'll start to go through these models and then think about how they, what they mean in relation to, um, to the problems I've identified on my earlier slide. So quality of results. This is the idea, and it's very popular um, in actually in higher education, that what our quality law seeks to be doing so much is not ensuring everybody's treated the same, but making sure that there is an equal or fair distribution of socially valuable goods and services. So we want to make sure that all the good things in life are equally distributed among the community. So it's not just, um, I'll use a trite example, it's not just white men who are um, participating in the decision-making at uh, higher education committees, but it's uh, younger people, it's women, it's people of color, it's different able people. So we want to make sure that our socially valuable goods are shared among everybody. And this model permits quotas and targeting. And quotas are often seen as very controversial because they're seen as anti-equality. The idea that if we treat everybody the same, we shouldn't have a quota because that would get rid of, of merit and everyone's not being treated up based on their merit, everyone's being treated based on their skin color or based on their gender. But under equality of results, it's allowed because our point of our equality law isn't consistency, but our point of our equality law is to make sure there's a fair distribution of socially valuable goods. There are some problems with this model of equality. It is obviously controversial around relations, um, pardon me, issues of quotas. And we can see that from um, some of the US Supreme Court case law. And there's some case law coming, which will probably be coming out this summer uh, about the future of quotas in higher education in the US. But even apart from the controversies around um, quotas, is, is the quality of results the only model we want to be thinking about? So while the quality of results is looks at have we fairly distributed socially beneficial goods, what happens if we can't count the goods that we think are beneficial that should be distributed? So um, it, you see quality results being used a lot in relation to, to things that you can count. How many students of color are there at a university? How many women are professors? But we're not able to figure out, well, what's the experience of being a law student of color? Is the experience of being a law student of color student of color, actually one of exclusion, oppression, marginalization, st stigmatization, stigmatization, pardon me. So that you might be in the law school, but your experience of it is so detrimental that we can't tr truly say equality has been achieved. So quality of results is something um, that can, it looks really good on paper. It's very attractive because it's, it's making sure the good things in life are equally shared, but it might miss certain things and might not be able to capture certain things that we think equality law should care deeply about, like the experience of being in law school or the experience of being um, someone who's not a white man on a corporate board. The next issue model of equality is equality of opportunities. And this is particularly um, prominent in, in political discourse. That, and you'll see politicians kind of make this repeatedly make this claim that we should all have an equal opportunity to succeed in life. 
So that's why I have the image of, of a race that are the point of equality law is to bring us all up to a certain starting point. And then after we all reach that starting point, individual merit takes over. So if someone runs really fast, they win the race and they win the desirable things in life. And if someone runs a bit slower, they will win less of the desirable things in life. But that inequality that exists after the starting point, we don't care about because our point of equality laws is to make sure everyone gets that fair and same starting point. There, unsurprisingly, there are some problems with this model as well. One would, the, the first with the analogy of the race is, should we be, should we be worried that people, even if, even if they are not as meritorious as our, as our fastest runner, might still be denied access to valuable goods and services or the valuable things in life? So should the inequality that exists beyond the starting line, is it completely irrelevant? So the fact that someone might um, not be as a diligent worker or as someone who will put in hours of studying, does that mean that they should be denied access to healthcare, access to education or affordable housing? So this model of equality allows inequality to exist maybe in things that are actually quite important and that we should care deeply about. The other question is, well, what is the starting line that we, we should be worried about? What is this, where is this equal line that we need to be getting everybody to? And this is where the procedural radical point comes in. Is equality law only worried about making sure that there's a fair process? So the example here would be in employment law. Um, you know, many people will have either experienced or have heard stories or rumors or other people's um, experiences or histories of um, employment opportunities not always being openly posted and kind of being a sort of boys club or boys network where job opportunities would go to people who were in the know or who were well connected. And so it was a way to exclude people who were not as well connected, not as well um, established in certain networks, women, people of color. And so the push for equality opportunities to make sure that everybody has a chance to apply for that job by making sure that it's posted openly, that everyone has a chance to put their application in. Of course, that's a very important step that needs to happen, but it might not be enough. It might not, putting the notice up doesn't mean that everybody's equally able to apply for that job. If that job requires you, I'll use an example of firefighting. So we post a job for firefighting, which is a traditionally male profession. We post it openly so that women can apply for that job. But if women have childcare responsibilities and um, childcare child, like a formal childcare um, provision is only from a nine to five window, well, firefighting works uh, irregular hours. So while the woman might be able to apply because the job is listed, her childcare opportunities and the way the system of childcare works means she's not able to apply for that job. So the, we, we may have opened up a process we have not addressed some of the more systemic issues that prevent somebody from applying for that job. So we could think more radically about, well, what is the starting line that we really care about? Do we wanna make sure that everybody's actually not only given notice of a job, but is in a position to meaningfully apply for that job? And that's where the radical part comes in. That radical component of equality of opportunity has not probably really been realized and it's been collapsed into the more procedural aspect. Uh, and so when we hear politicians and the like talk about equality of opportunity, it's much more around that we just want to get you to the starting point and then whatever happens after the starting point is beyond um, the purview of equality law. Pardon me, I have a wee bit of a cold this morning, so I need to I need a sip of water. The next important model that um, was developed in the jurisprudence and in many different courts around the world is that, well, okay, we can see that trying to make sure we have a fair distribution of goods, trying to make sure we all get to an initial starting point has some real conceptual problems and conceptual flaws. So actually maybe what we should be worried about or what equality law should be seeking to achieve is human dignity. That every person should be treated as an equal in human dignity. And this has a lot of rhetorical pull. It has a lot of intuitive sort of almost like moral, emotional pull that every person has an equal amount of human dignity. And the point of our equality law is to make sure that the law expresses the equal worth of every human being and the equal dignity of every human being, regardless of any characteristic they may or may not possess. And this 
concept of, of equality and dignity got very deeply intertwined and so intertwined that um, it was a basis for some very important case on some very important um, jurisprudential strides in relation to LGBTQIA equality in um, particularly around same-sex marriage or around um, decriminalizing same-sex sexual relations. So the idea of dignity was so profound uh, in, in trying to dismantle sort of heteronormativity that to be equal meant to be um, dignified and that meant to have, to have equal access to institutions like marriage that are so pivotal to, to personhood and to identity and to, to what it means to, to conform loving, loving relationships, intimate relationships. Same with the idea of decriminalization of um, any kind of law on uh, same-sex sexual activity, that it offends dignity, it offends the equal dignity of every human being to criminalize such intimate aspects of a person's life. And there's increasingly um, a kind of glow, pardon me, growing global consensus around dignity in marriage and dignity in sexual activity. But there are some, again, real flaws of dignity because dignity is such a malleable concept. And what we might think of as dignified can change from person to person or from community to, to, to community. So I can walk through some examples to show the, the difficulty of thinking about what well, we want to be equal in dignity. If someone is sex work undignified. So if we criminalize sex work, could a sex worker argue, well, that's a violation of my equality because the law is not treating me dignified because it's criminalizing my livelihood. Some people argue that sex work is, a, is part of life like any other profession and it is a dignified thing to do. Other people argue that sex work is undignified and it inherently commodifies the body and perpetuates gender inequality and gender-based violence. So those are two very rational arguments and saying and dignity doesn't really give us any, any way to resolve those rational kind of arguments and both those arguments are based on dignity. Another one that comes to play is poverty. So is it undignified to be poor? If someone lives in poverty, has their equality as their equal worth as a human being, their equal dignity been violated. Some people argue that dignity does require the provision of a certain amount of material resources. Other people say dignity is sort of independent of material resources. So these, the kind of malleability of dignity, it's, it has led theorists and, and courts to reject it as, a, as maybe a faulty foundation for all of equality law. And this leads to um, the multidimensional concept of equality. And this tries to bring together some of the insights from different models of equality and to build on some of the critiques that have existed. And it was pioneered by Professor Sandra Fredman from the University of Oxford and has been picked up and, and adopted by different courts around the world and by different um, UN human rights treaty bodies. So, and I'll just walk through the different, the different dimensions here. First, our, what we want our right to equality to be achieving can't be collapsed into one normative value. Pardon me, I'm not sure why my buzzer is going off, but I'll just ignore it. Um, the fun of doing things from home um, is that the, we don't want our right to equality to be only collapsed into one normative value. That's maybe asking too much of a normative value. We don't want just results. We don't want just opportunity. We don't want just dignity. We don't want just consistency. What we want to start to think about is a multidimensional concept of equality, that what we want our quality law to be doing is multiple things at the same time. So first we want our right to equality to address redress disadvantage. So we want our quality law to be pinpointing and understanding that certain groups are, have been historically oppressed, historically disadvantaged, and that they have, they have that different starting point. And we need our equality law not to be thinking that everyone should be treated consistently, but to recognize that some people start from a different starting point. Some people ha have a legacy of disadvantage and we need to be making laws that understand that disadvantage. The second is that we want our equality law to counter prejudice, stigma, stereotyping, humiliation, violence based on any kind of identity or protected characteristics. So we want our equality law to be tackling prejudices against migrants or prejudice against women or stereotyping against disabled people. And the most extreme kind of forms of, of um, stigma, prejudice and stereotyping in, in 
humiliation and violence. And the third thing we want our equality law to be doing is to enhancing voice and participation. It's a recognition that certain groups have been excluded from political avenues of participation for long periods of history. And what we want our equality law to be doing is to facilitate an individual voice, facilitating group voice in political decision-making, in social decision-making. We want to bring people into the community as opposed to work having our law exclude or silence or marginalize voices. And finally, and perhaps maybe the most important, is that we want our equality law to both accommodate and valorize difference. And we want our equality law to be addressing structures and institutions that, and systems that perpetuate inequalities, that perpetuate exclusion and perpetuate disadvantage. So I mentioned earlier the firefighter example and the woman who has childcare responsibility. We've structured our working day and our childcare provision around a working day of nine to five. But we have many individuals who work irregular hours and we need to be designing um, the provision of care that mimics and mirrors their hours of work so that they are not excluded from participating in the formal labor market because of their child caring responsibilities. Just briefly, the last um, thing to talk about is just four other key concepts that are useful for then turning to the second part about the challenges and is equality law up to the challenge. First is direct discrimination. Um, that's the concept that prohibits explicit differential treatment. So many um, either constitutions or statutes in a, in a country will say, you cannot treat people differently based on certain characteristics. An example of this is some jurisdictions still have prohibitions on certain types of work for women. So women couldn't work in a mine. That would be an example of direct discrimination. Indirect discrimination is, um, is maybe more prominent in the 21st century um, because we have a more of a recognition that we shouldn't treat people differently explicitly based on their identity characteristics. But indirect discrimination is the idea that we have a neutral law, but when it's applied to everybody, it actually works at disadvantage differential um, pe people who have an identity characteristic. So this uh, concept was born or originated in the US Supreme Court in a case called Briggs and Duke Power, where it was a, a, an employer said, everyone who works in my factory has to have a high school education. It's a very neutral rule. And then the question when that rule was applied, it showed that actually only white people were able to meet that rule and black people could not meet that rule. And they were excluded from employment in a very sort of socially valuable um, institution, having a job. And the reason they couldn't make that uh, qualification isn't because black people decided not to, not to finish high school, but because of the systemic racism in the US that had denied them access to education. You can see the age of the case too, it's from 1971. So it's a recognition that actually the, the history of disadvantage, the systems of oppression, when a neutral rule applied, actually re-entrenched and further cemented those um, oppression and, and exclusion. Intersectionality, the third concept of my slide here, looks at or is a recognition that we're all we're not just one thing, that humans are um, a diverse collection of characteristics and that we can't collapse people into one dimensions. And this concept was um, originally with Kimberly Crenshaw in the US, and it was the recognition that the disadvantage and the inequalities that black women experience cannot be cl collapsed solely into racial discrimination, and it can't be collapsed solely into gender discrimination. That it was the synergy between being black and being a woman that could only fully explain what the, the inequality black women experienced. It was an intersection of gender and race. And that insight from Kimberly Crenshaw has, has both been um, further developed by herself and other Black US scholars and activists and kind of exploded across many different disciplines and many different identity characteristics. So um, recognizing that um, the intersection between disability and sexual orientation or the intersection between non-gender binary and, and race. So it's just a recognition that we are all a collection of identity characteristics and how those characteristics intersect can help us give a better, more fine-tuned understanding about inequality, oppression, disadvantage, exclusion, and stigmas. And lastly, one more key concept is justification. So many constitutional um, documents or human rights instruments recognize that 
rights can, and equality rights can be breached as long as they can be justified. So the state might be able to say, yes, we recognize that this law we want to pass is perpetuates an inequality, but we think that there's a very legitimate reason, that there's a very important rationale, that this, this, lim this limitation of equality is necessary. So the state can justify an inequality. And we'll see in the next section how, how that can be really important um, or how that can throw up a challenge for equality law in trying to tackle these 21st century problems. Okay. Pardon me. So turning to the first 21st century challenge, which is the growing and ever seemingly ever growing in economic inequality. Um, in the past couple of days in the UK, there's been um, postings about you know, the, the, the rockets and historic level of profits of oil companies, uh, which is coinciding with uh, a, a deepening cost of living crisis and ever increasing um, squeeze on, on people's incomes. So we can see in our, in our own lives, the kind of rise of concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. So we can see that there's just pure material economic inequality. People have less access and control over financial resources. And so on one hand, we might think, well, equality law seems a perfect tool for this because most people, when they sort of intuitively think of equality, sort of think about equality in terms of material resources. To lean back on my sibling example, the material resource of cake and, and who has cake and who doesn't have cake and making sure we have a consistent distribution of cake. Historically though, economic inequalities have not been the purview of equality law. They've been seen as a matter of political, a political question, how economic resources, resources should be distributed is seen as not something that courts and lawyers who are unelected, who are sort of don't have the democratic legitimacy of politicians should not be getting involved in. And that the redistribution of resources is something not even maybe just for politicians, but something for the free market, that people who work hard and are meritorious get to earn more of control of the economic resources and people who are not do not. And that is just the way merit works. But when we start to apply an equality law, particularly a substantive or multidimensional concept of equality, we can start to unpick that maybe there is quite a role for equality law and it might be up to starting to redress this, this ever pressing challenge of the 21st century. The first way it can is that is a recognition that economic inequality isn't only about inequality in material resources, but it's also a matter of inequality in relation to status, in relation to stigmas and prejudice and stereotyping. Because it's an assumption that people are living in poverty because they are unmeritorious, because they didn't work hard, because they didn't study hard, because they're lazy or because they're a scrounger or because they're uh, a benefit sucker. And we can start to use our equality law to challenge those stereotypes that people are in poverty because they deserve it or because they are unmeritorious, or because they didn't work hard or because they are lazy. We can start to unpick that stereotype and show up for what it is, a stereotype, Sometimes you can do that with evidence to show that many people who live under definitions of poverty in, in the state are working for it. It's the reasons they're, they are not have, do not have control of economic resources isn't because they're not working, but it's because minimum wage is very low or cost of living is very high. The other thing that uh, um, intersection between status harms and poverty is that it can start to tackle some of these intersections between economic harms and stigmatic harms in our employment law and how our employment law can sometimes be tools to, to keep people um, keep people within poverty. So I put two cases on the slide that are quite recent from the South African and Indian Supreme Court. The first one from the South African court was where domestic workers were excluded from workers' compensation when they were injured at work. So they were denied monetary compensation if they experienced a workplace injury. And the reason they were excluded has to do with lots of historic reasons around who is performing domestic work. It's usually women. It's usually women of, in South Africa. It's women of color and women who live in, who are already poor. And it's also the type of work they're performing, domestic work. Domestic work has historically been performed unpaid by women within the, their own home. And it's, so it's been, when it's performed in someone else's home, it's not seen as work that is deserving of monetary compensation, but as an extension of women's unpaid work that they do in their own home, and they should be doing it on the cheap 
in someone else's home. So the exclusion of, of this type of work is because of stigmas and stereotypes around in South Africa around black women who live in poverty and stigmas and stereotypes and cultural prejudices around the value of care work. And so it's the intersection between our understandings of what is valuable work and who is a valuable worker intersecting with monetary um, or exclusion from, from protection of labor law or from the monetary benefits that come from being hurt at work. So the African court then said, struck the law down or, or said you have to basically include domestic workers within worker compensation schemes. And this is a way to start to redress the, the intersection between status harms and, and material poverty. The other is uh, from the Indian Supreme Court was that women were being denied promotion. There was a promotion criteria that had been developed in the army. The promotion criteria fit very well for a man's career pattern. It didn't fit so well for a women's career pattern and women were being disproportionately um, excluded. So similar, similar to the uh, indirect discrimination. So the court said that, that, that the, the promotion system was structurally disadvantaging women, resulting in them being denied promotion, being denied the economic benefits of, of promotion. So we can see then how, how our laws are able to or start to peel back these barriers that are preventing people from being able to access and control economic resources. Many people think that poverty should then be put seen as a ground of discrimination. And the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Poverty has, has been advocating for that recently in his work. Much like we have prohibitions on race discrimination, gender discrimination, we should have prohibitions on poverty discrimination. So we should not stop treating people differently because they are poor. And that is obviously seen as very controversial. Some people think it's legitimate to treat people differently because they are poor, to put conditions that they have to fulfill if they're going to access social welfare, or to deny someone is on social welfare to say, I won't rent you an apartment because I don't believe you're, you're financially trustworthy. Which again, is a stereotype based on the idea that people who live in poverty are there because they make bad financial decisions. Another concern about having poverty as a ground of discrimination leads to my uh, final point in this slide about the, the kind of barrier between law and politics of the role of courts. Courts often see that it is not their job to redress poverty or to solve issues of poverty. They see this as beyond what a court's legitimately allowed to do. Courts are there you know, to uphold rights, to, to apply the law, but they're not there to make these sort of macro financial economic decisions about how resources should be distributed. They see that as something that's more appropriate for the political arena. And of course, as good lawyers, we can start to challenge that because many of the um, laws that perpetuate economic inequality are based on stereotypes and stigmas. There is a series of cases from the UK about access to social welfare that were based on stereotypes that women in poverty were poor because they were lazy, that um, women in poverty needed to be incentivized into work through even more extreme poverty, and that based on the idea that taking care of your own children was not socially valuable work. All of these things are, are you know, our second dimension of substantive equality could really start to address. And, it's, and the second dimension of equality law particularly around stigmas and, and stereotypes and cultural prejudices is a kind of a cornerstone of what we think equality law should be doing. So we can start to bring that lens to economic decision-making to start to show up how economic decision-making is based on, on stigmas and prejudices and stereotyping. And we can start to use, use our equality law then to, to tackle the systems that, that keep some people in poverty. Um, so there's, there's I, I would make the case that it is up to the challenge and it's up to equality law, law lawyers and scholars to start pushing the idea more soundly that um, economic inequality is so deeply meshed with status inequality. And that means that there is a role for courts to start to peel back how um, assumptions about certain types of people feed into economic policy making. The next challenge, just keeping an eye on my time here, is relation to COVID. So we've all experienced in different ways the pandemic and experienced different forms of lockdown measures and safety measures. And now we're experiencing um, a more long-term recovery measures. And we can see, start to see here some of the indirect discrimination. Often uh, recovery measures from a crisis, be it economic or health like COVID, are directed towards certain sectors that we need to jumpstart the economy after this crisis so we will direct resources to 
um, infrastructure building and and um, industry that will somehow generate economic growth. It's rare to see recovery measures directed towards the provision of services. So um, provision of care services, provision of um, personal grooming services, all those industries were very heavily hurt by COVID, but we've constant, often recovery measures are targeted towards essentially male dominated industries and female dominated industries do not see the benefit from, from recovery measures. So we can see an indir a gendered indirect discrimination in how, um, how recovery measures are being employed. And we can then start, if we can see that gender discrimination, we can start to use our equality law to challenge the, the inequality in what's seen as important or what's seen as valuable in a recovery effort. The next challenge with COVID is around the role of justification. COVID was very fast moving, evidence about how the disease was spread, what the disease was, was ever growing, and courts had to make quick decisions quite quickly on whether some whether lockdown measures were were legally permissible, whether restrictions on your freedom to move around were permissible. And when you're operating in context of emergency with imperfect knowledge, some people criticize it that maybe courts were too willing to justify lockdown measures. And it shows us the importance of justification and taking justification seriously when we're trying to tackle 21st century problems. And that as lawyers, it's not that we need to be saying, or quality law lawyers, that um, we should never limit rights per se, but what we need to be advocating for is that if the government wants to limit our equality rights or to treat us unequally, they need to be coming with evidence-backed reasons for why they want to limit that. That we shouldn't be relying on the state's um, as mere assertion that it's in the interest of the public good to limit our equality rights, but that they need to bring as detailed evidence as, as exists to justify that. And the last thing COVID really showed up is also the clash, clash of legal regimes. An equal right to health would show us quite clearly that um, everyone in the world should be equally entitled to an access to a vaccine. But we know that um, that is not the case, that vaccines distribution was concentrated in certain parts of the world and other parts of the world have not had the same access to, to um, vaccines. And, and sometimes that unequal distribution is a result of um, intellectual property law and global economic law. So we have a, one international human rights regime that might mandate uh, and push quite strongly for equal resolution or equal distribution of health. And the second would say there should be controls on, on how um, it's distributed. So we have a clash of legal regimes that we don't have a quite yet clarity on how they should be resolved. So we need to think about how does equality law um, interact with, with other forms of law. And that, that's still a question that I think we have not maybe arrived at a kind of a solution. Obviously as a quality law lawyer, I have my own answers about that there needs to be preference given to equality law, but I think there needs to be um, careful consideration about how different legal regimes interact. And my last uh, slide before I kind of end, and I can see there's a hand, so I'll make sure to save time for questions, is climate change. Obviously, the climate crisis is, is again ever growing, ever increasing. We can usually start to see it in our in our lives with increasingly hot summers and increasingly cold winters. Many would argue that um, climate crisis is a great leveler because we're all going to be affected by that, as there is no planet B, so we're all going to be bound to endure whatever climate change throws at us. But when we peel back some of the evidence, we can start to see that actually it's not equal. That there are global disparities between who's going to be affected and who's not going to be affected with certain parts of the world in the global south to be you know, extremely affected to the point where their, their, their land may not exist anymore. And within the state, there will be inequality in, in who's able to adapt, and who's able to not adapt to the realities of the climate crisis, and who is being asked to bear the burden of the climate crisis. And we can see it's typically the oppression, it's the groups who are already oppressed within the society are the ones who are going to be bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. And so that would lead us to think that maybe we can start to use our equality law to mandate act legal action on climate change. That a right to be equal mean, starts to, will have to mean that, uh, or to include rights or elements of a, of a, of a clean environment or, or a healthy planet. And there's litigation that's starting to come up in, among many different courts around the world using not only equality law, but um, different types of law to say that there are human rights, that climate change is a matter of human rights. 
And it's not just a political issue or an environmental issue, but it's a matter of my right to be equal. That means I have to have um, equal access to clean air, or equal access to clean water. The other though challenge with this approach in the 21st century is territorial boundaries. Most of our law is, you know, it's either within the state or maybe slightly regional. Uh, the inter truly international exists obviously with the, with the UN, but it has such weak enforcement mechanisms that it might, you know, they're easy, they're easy for states to continue to ignore. Whereas a law that has maybe even more teeth about, about enforcement uh, is subject to territorial boundaries. It only applies in, in state, but climate change does not respect territorial boundaries. It, it is everywhere and it it's, interacts with a, a global system. And so our law is designed for a very narrow way, but the problem we're wanting it to deal with is, is global. So we're gonna have to give careful consideration to how, how to, how to um, navigate that disjuncture. So while I, I'll just wrap up so I can take some questions is, um, or maybe I'm the one who raised the hand, I'm, if I am, I'm sorry, is uh, I do think a quality law is up to the challenge. The challenges are real. It requires us to bring a very rich conception of what it means to be equal to the table if we're meant to address these challenges. It requires us to demand clear evidence from our, from our states and our governments for why we can't be equal or why they want to limit our equality. And it requires us to think innovatively and creatively about who's being excluded, why are they being excluded, why, why is consistency not always the central aim, and how can we ensure our legal regime interacts uh, both with other legal regimes and with the scope and scale of the problems that we're facing in the 21st century. So I'll leave it there and um, look forward to dialogue questions and, and thank you for having me. Um, so there's a question here about, um, will the laws around the COVID pandemic lockdowns and their effects on equality be reviewed and analyzed that we are better prepared for future pandemics? That is a good question. I think there's a lot of scholarship going on right now. And there's an interesting, one of my um, colleagues uh, at the University of Birmingham, Fiona DeLondres has been looking at lockdown laws and looking at what we can possibly learn from them and how decision-making happens in the context of emergencies. And I think we need also to think more clearly about what is the impact of these laws and one of the things, and how can we learn from them both for maybe future pandemics and also for future non-pandemic scenarios. So gender-based, there's been spikes in gender-based violence during, um, during the pandemic. And when people are in lockdown, they cannot as access uh, safe places or access services or access healthcare in the same way because they were not allowed to leave the house. So then it led to innovations in how to reach victims of, of gender-based violence through, um, through if you, you know, still were allowed to go to the store. So how to have, how to have um, contact points or, or access points to services built within, discreetly within a, a grocery store to make sure that people could able access its access safety measures in a safe manner. So we can start to think about, oh, how could we use that um, and build upon that knowledge in day-to-day -day life, in, in non-crisis moments. So I think that there is a lot that we can learn from our, from the equality, understanding how the law treated people unequally in a pandemic or in any type of crisis, to think about, well, what does it show about the crisis? What does it show about the assumptions the government has made? And what does it tell us about how we go moving forward? One of the things I've written about is looking at how the economic crisis in 2008 and the UK government's response with austerity measures and how the assumption was that austerity wasn't caused by the banking crisis, but if you look at the press, it got changed into a crisis of welfare spending. So it demonized our economic woes were blamed on, on people who live in poverty. And then when the government came and restricted access to social benefits, that was seen as legitimate because the, the narrative had been pumped into the, into the collective system, so to speak, that um, we're in the financial state because of, of people who live in poverty. Therefore, people who um, who live in poverty, it's okay to restrict their access benefits because we have to curb our spending because it was them who got us there in the first place. So the second, the second question is, um, what got me into this area of law is, is a case, uh, I'm Canadian, so I studied law school, I went to law school in Canada, and there's a case called Goslin, uh, which is a case where people under 30 were denied, were not given equal access to welfare benefits. So if there's a welfare benefit, just make up a number, 100 pounds a month, they were only given 50 pounds a month, because there was an assumption that it was easier for someone in, who was young to get a job. That assumption was not backed by empirical data. Um, there was a, a crisis. 
uh, and there was a job crisis. There's, there was no job for young people, so they could not easily find a job. And so the, but the court just disbelieved that assumption, the government stated without looking at the empirical data, which uh, back to my justification point is something we should not be doing. If we're gonna take away people's equality, that we have to make sure that the assumptions the government's working on are actually true. And the second, or I mean, probably more important is that Canada is a very wealthy country and the fact that we're going to impose income poverty on people under 30 felt morally wrong. And it made me think, I'm, I'm, I am I'm, wanna know more about equality law and then I've been very privileged to get the chance to um, keep reading and studying and, and, and writing on equality law. So how can we collaborate effectively on equality law so the quality issues address globally rather than nationally? I think that is a really important point and I think I think how to collaborate globally rather than nationally on equality law involves multiple actors, it involves um, institutions like this that provide opportunities for us to learn from each other. I think it also um, means having workshops where different civil society organizations come together who are working on the ground on similar issues. They can compare and contrast different strategic approaches to how they go about advocating equality so they can learn best practices, learn what failed in one jurisdiction and then think, oh, I could adapt that or learn from that and, and modify that in my own jurisdiction. I think there needs to be a, a more of a solid push for talking about equality. Um, I guess I would say everyone pumps their own discipline to say that there should be equality law as mandated as part of a, of a curriculum so that all law students come out knowing a little bit about equality law and can bring that to their practice so that, that there's um, more cross, cross discipline, uh, cross, cross profession, understanding of equality law and they bring it to, to the questions that they, are, um, that they are doing in their day-to-day -day lives. So I think it's people standing up and saying they're very interested in equality. It's us talking to each other across even social media and Twitter and sharing information, sharing resources, uh, making things as open access and as easy to access online as possible so that we can learn from each other and, 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 and celebrate the victories of, of, of equality because sometimes it's a lot of losses. So it's important, I think, to celebrate when, when we see things that are, that are good happening and share those, those victories and learn from them as well. And if anyone wants to get involved into equality law, I think the first thing is to try to find a way to study it. It is helpful to, to kind of immerse yourself in the reading and, and to enjoy the reading and enjoy to wrapping your head around it. The second is to kind of, I guess, take, a, take advantage of the free resources online, you know, YouTube lectures on equality law. There are, there are many wonderful speakers who put their stuff up on and it's a great way and a you know, very easy way to kind of learn more. It doesn't involve reading. To look at, to find podcasts you like too. There's a, such a wealth of podcasts. I, I produce a Rights Up podcast that has lots of resources and talk, lots of talking about equality. And there's a series called Exponential Inequalities um, that talks specifically about equality law in times of crisis and particularly in relation to COVID. Um, so I'd encourage people to, to look that up. And it's called Rights Up. So to access, to just do the Googling and finding the resources that are useful. And then, it, to make a profession or a career out of it is to either, you know, thinking about being an academic or working in civil society. There are so many groups around the world that are so committed to trying to make the world more equal. Uh, and they are looking for dedicated, committed, passionate people. And so I think getting a little bit of training or a little bit of experience and then looking to work in those organizations can be a really wonderful way to get involved and to help to work at addressing the, the problems I've identified in the lecture. Perfect. Um, that was an amazing talk, Megan. Thank you so much uh, for coming today and sharing with us all the information. Um, and thank you with partnering with us with the UniWell Open Lecture Series as well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm going to now stop the recording.